Is that? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Courtney Shaw. I'm the facilitator of our community conversations series at LCC. And I want to welcome you to our last uh, presentation of the quarter. So we will not be meeting next week. It is Thanksgiving and then we go into preparation for finals. So we don't have any events after that, but we will be back in the winter with a uh, series on communications that'll be starting on January 14th. So please uh, keep an eye out on the website. We'll have more details as we start firming that up. We'll have our schedule, our speakers, our topics, all that hammered out probably in January. So uh, make sure to, to check back with that. Uh, also, if you are in Humanities 106, reminder that this is your last event. You have one, uh, you have your paper to do on this, and then we have the final discussion. That's your last assignment in the class. So please make sure to look for that on the Canvas site. And thank you all for joining us in this uh, new and old new territory that we're, we're working on with Zoom to make this happen. I've heard from several of you that you're really glad we're continuing with the series, and that makes my heart you know, grow three sizes in one day, like the Grinch, uh, to know that people are still out there and still want to learn more things and continue the conversation in whatever form that we can get it to you. So thank you for joining us. This week, we have Michael Strayer as our speaker. Michael Strayer teaches psychology here at LCC. He was born and raised in Longview and was a student at LCC right out of high school in 1970. He told me it was okay to drop the date. Then on to Evergreen and Whitworth University. <laughs> He's worked as a community activist, a Head Start bus driver, a home and family life coordinator, a therapist, and has taught at LCC for, and I quote, far too long. And I also just want to give a shout out to Michael Strayer as a member of my department, the social sciences department. He is the one who is always there to, uh, to reassure us, to share a joke, which we might not get a lot of considering the topic today, uh, but really is, is very good at sort of uh, bolstering spirits around the campus and around the department especially. So please welcome Michael Strayer. Is there applause? Can I, I don't hear any. Oh, well, thanks. Well, thanks, Courtney. I'm, I'm actually very humbled to be here. And since we'll be talking about anxiety today, I thought I would mention mine. For whatever reason, I feel more anxiety in doing this presentation online than I would if there was an actual audience of people. I'm not sure about this. I think it's a COVID thing. So let us start here. So I'm gonna talk about trans, uh, transgenerational trauma. The terms that you see there in front of you, transgenerational trauma, intergenerational trauma, and post-traumatic black slave syndrome uh, actually mean very, very similar things. The term I'll use most often is transgenerational. And I'm going to have the uh, theorist actually explain to you post-traumatic black slave syndrome in a couple of minutes. And I'm going to take what is known as a, a biopsychosocial perspective uh, because as we know now in the social sciences and human biology and genetics, you cannot separate them. You can't separate our biology um, from our mind and our emotions, from our behavior, and from all those social influences that um, are all around us. So uh, this is my first time of doing this, so I hope. Well, what I want to do first, though, is talk about individual trauma. Um, most of us have experienced some trauma, and if you haven't, you've at least been exposed to trauma in some way. So it's a human condition, it's a human experience, uh, whether someone close to us dies, whether we're in an accident or with someone, divorce, separation, loss. Now, a vicarious trauma is just being affected by others' trauma. You don't have to have it yourself. A good example of this would be many individual members of a family from someone who's experienced individual trauma are affected and they can actually acquire post-traumatic stress disorder. War veterans would be a good example of that. Um, but think about all of our first responders today, all of our COVID workers who are not, trauma isn't hitting them individually. They're not uh, having uh, the illness themselves, but they see the trauma over and over again every day 
which takes its toll on them. Sometimes, not for months or even years, do the symptoms of trauma begin uh, to manifest themselves. And if you can see this diagram, okay, you can see that there's a number of behavioral and emotional and physical effects uh, from trauma. Uh, self-destructive behaviors you see there can be things like just drinking alcohol or drugs is very self-destructive. Trouble sleeping, trouble eating, lots of anxiety. In fact, anxiety and depression are the two most common psychological disorders that will emanate from trauma. On the other hand, many of us have experienced firsthand or secondhand trauma and don't know that it is affecting us. A person may say, I don't have any trouble sleeping. I don't have depression, anxiety, but possibly they get migraines. Maybe they have a lot of stomach distress. Maybe their social patterns have changed. Those can all be uh, symptoms um, of trauma. Am I talking too fast? Now, often, as I've already said, trauma is invisible and sometimes it's hidden on purpose. Uh, childhood trauma, especially if it's sexual trauma, um, we may not tell anyone. We may not even tell our family. Often we have so much shame. Maybe it is a, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent who had a severe psychological disorder like schizophrenia and they were institutionalized. And yet the family never acknowledges it. They never talk about it. Uh, if indeed trauma in fact, uh, affects the whole family, then it must be addressed, it must be talked about. Otherwise it will remain unconscious and it will continue to affect our health and the dynamics um, of our relationships. I would imagine, a good question I ask my students often is to ask their parents if they're available to them or grandparents and to ask them, what are some of the family secrets I don't know about? For myself, I didn't find out to my dad, I think he was in his 80s, that he was in prison for a while for sleeping with an underaged girl. Anyway, <laughs> That trauma, he had so much shame about that, he had never shared it, and he had to wait till the end of his life. I just thought it was so interesting to know that information. I may actually have a couple siblings out there somewhere I don't know about. Again, all of these things, whether you experience the trauma or not, is going to have these kinds of effects. Um, I, I would compare this to um, if you throw a stone into water, you can see the individual trauma is there in the middle, and then it ripples out, affecting everybody around them. Uh, your family, your loved ones, your children, your workmates, your colleagues, your neighbors. We'll just watch that one more time as you can see that. Now, of course, it's a water drop, but it gives us kind of the same uh, effect here. Often we don't realize how it is affecting others. I like to compare trauma to a hurricane. For the individual, it is so powerful there. We are right in the very middle and the effects are swirling around, all around us. And in a real hurricane, it's enough, as you can see in the uh, image there, to destroy an entire city, a town, an island. The one thing about a hurricane is usually, usually, they're not one after the other. The hurricane subsides, there is building, there is healing, there is grief. What if we were to have a hurricane every day or every week or every month. I call this hurricane slavery because slavery endured a, a drastic, horrendous wound on the nation of America affecting everyone. And we've tried to hide it. Um, we don't like to admit it. And the ramifications of this continue like a never ending hurricane that we don't get time to rebuild or we don't know 
how to rebuild it. Another graphic I would compare it to is it looks like this. Slavery has actually destroyed the bonds of so many people, so much of our culture. Now this is a droplet of water being exploded and you can see how it actually breaks down the atom bombs, atom molecules, the atoms here are broken apart and they'll never be able to be placed back together again. Now I'm going to use, there are two books I'm using as primary sources here for this talk. And the first one is Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, Dr. Joy DeGruy. And she is from the University of uh, Portland State University. And the other one I'm going to use, which I'll mention later, is Beverly Daniel Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Children um, Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And with this, I'm really uncomfortable as a white man talking about the experience of African-American individuals. And with that, I thought I would let uh, Dr. DeGroy actually explain this concept herself. So this is a five minute video and it is closed captioned. So if you can't hear the sound very well, you'll be able to read it. An explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult with it is that first response, oh my God, that happens to me. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on, and then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, three, no help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters, and their families, children, generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African-American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear, long enduring trauma. So I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and the contemporary living in African-American spaces. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as well, cultural, as adaptive, survival. Well, what are they? Let's just say in 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I know some of your son went to school. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. And she begins to go on and on about he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realized the black mother's son is actually excelling. She said, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience, it doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying no, she's denigrated? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back to the reader. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He's, he's stupid. He's, he's shitless. He can't work. He said, I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate him to protect him. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of him? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by post-traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of physical trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. You can just hear about something horrific happening to someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder. 
process. Then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize a way of living and being. Everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're going to fold in things that you just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, uh, feeling of foreshortened future. There was a point where there would have African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adult because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like with 13, 12, check stand. When you start looking at the simple biology, you start looking at the, the impact of stress on them. And while we look at general stress, you know, finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know a compromise is immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize. It becomes part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information they need, they can use it. I think the first order of business is beginning to have a conversation. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a pill. It's in fairness and justice and safety and equity. We've got to work with some of those clinical things, some of those issues of panic and anxiety. We also have to deal with the fact that you have a system that is set up to oppress you and to continue to hate you. Both those things have to be dealt with. And they cannot singularly by themselves affect the change. They have to be done. I can't recommend DeGroy's book enough. It's a very difficult read and difficult, I mean, emotional. There are times, uh, many times I had to put it down and even skip over areas because it is painful. I'm wondering if any of you felt a little defensive um, as you were listening uh, to Dr. DeGruy. I find that when I teach about racism, the effects of slavery, many, many students are very defensive. Um, and I think that that defensiveness has a number of explanations. Well, one, as a white person, uh, maybe I don't want to admit that somehow my people, my ancestors have been culpable in uh, slavery and racism and lynching uh, since then. Maybe it's because I do know, or, or maybe it's unconscious that I have a racial bias. And um, when I'm defensive, that might be telling me something about those ideologies that are the behaviors that I have. What I do know, at least from a psychology perspective, our defensiveness uh, is telling us something that we should pay attention to. I ask my students to tell me what are some, when they talk about race with family and friends, what are some of the things that they hear? And here they are. It's just a handful, but you're the racist for always talking about race. If people would just stop talking about racism, it'll go away. I don't see any racism. It's a lie by left wing radicals. Uh, I don't see color. I'm not a racist. I'm the least racist person you know. I wonder where that came from. I never enslaved or colonized anyone. That's history. Let it go. How can there be racism? Look at Oprah and LeBron and Barack Obama. Why are you so angry about this? You're white. These were from my students. Now, I don't know whether it's from them individually, but I did ask them, what are the things that you've encountered or heard? Um, maybe if you have more, you could actually put it into the question sections of this. And if we have time, we could read them later. Now, DeGroy reminds us that Black individuals are reminded and re-traumatized by slavery every day of their life. By the police killings, 
that are in the news all the time. Now that may not affect me as a white man, but if I am a black man or a black child uh, or a mother, I am going to uh, experience a great deal of anxiety and stress because of that. The numbers of unwarranted arrests and incarceration, discrimination, of course. Recently, the Southern Poverty Law Center reported that hate crimes in the US were the highest in 16 years. And that was the 2019 report. They expect the 2020 report to be even much higher. I know when I say things like this, students think I'm being political, but the um, Southern Poverty Law Center reports that um, in the 2016 and the 2020 election cycle, hate crimes were at the highest in counties that there were um, Trump rallies. Racial harassment. Um, if, you, if your skin is white, you've probably faced little or none of this, but if your skin is dark, you might face it every day. Uh, I have just a little example for you. This was just this week. It's just very short here. Like a white person in a white neighborhood, you're still acting like one of them. Now, the other thing that we know today that we didn't know earlier on in our research is that, and if you've read any news, you know that um, our black citizens are much more affected by the COVID virus. Um, they don't heal as well from it. They spend longer periods of time on a ventilator in the hospital and die far, far more often. All of these conditions that you see here on the screen are either double or higher when compared um, to white people. Let me just point out a couple of things uh, as you read this, but let's go to the last one. Black children ages five to 11 have the highest rate of death by suicide. Now, overall, um, African American adults have a far less rate of suicide compared to white adults, but black children, the research would suggest it is this constant exposure to racism, the harassment, um, this foreshortened sense of life expectancy when they see killings in the news. Now, I was first exposed to this idea that there may be a multi-generational link to trauma way back in the early 70s, as Courtney mentioned, at Evergreen. And it was from this researcher, uh, Vivian Rakoff. It sounds female, but it is a male. And he did this research on the children of Holocaust survivors. Now, indeed, different particular groups that have been um, brutalized and uh, were victims of genocide Native Americans, um, other indigenous peoples, um, the Jewish Holocaust. I could talk about those as well, but those are other presentations and other lectures. I'm specifically talking about uh, African Americans and uh, slavery here. So they actually found, the research went on for about 20 or plus years. When the full study was published in 88, they found that the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were overrepresented by 300% in psychiatric conditions. How could that be? Well, mostly they saw that this had to be some kind of um, behavioral acquisition, a modeling, if you will, from the parents and the grandparents. Uh, 
the quote from Rakoff here is, these studies reveal that any type of extreme prolonged stress have adverse psychological effects on children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, resulting in clinical anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. I might then actually suffer, suffer from PTSD, even though it was my grandfather or grandmother that experienced the trauma. Maybe this is why one of the reasons so many people are interested in their ancestry, doing the ancestry.com and the uh, 23 and me. Maybe the more we find out about um, our ancestors, their experience with trauma, we will understand ourselves better. Now, the newest study that we have here that shows a biological link to trauma, to slavery, is epigenetics. And I always say we are what our grandmothers ate because one Finnish study on um, malnourished um, different groups of people, they found evidence of adverse health effects in children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It's kind of where it started. So what does epigenetics mean? So um, it actually is not our genes themselves, not our DNA that does not change, but the, it, the epigenome changes. In other words, it means it's an addition to or above and beyond. This is beyond the DNA, the genes themselves. So what it is, it actually affects how our genes express themselves. Our genes are like switches that either get turned on or turned off, stay off or stay on. And we can pass those uh, along as easily as we pass our genes, such as I may have a family predisposition, a family history for depression, but those might remain off until I encounter possibly a traumatic event in my own life, even adulthood, which may switch those genes on and manifest themselves into a, a psychological condition or disorder um, of some kind. What evidence is there then to suggest that this is accurate? Well, as you see this picture of a mother rat, she is licking her pups. We, just the casual observer would probably think, well, she's cleaning them, yes. But what else is she doing? What do we do with our brand new babies as humans? She's stimulating them, showing them affection. So the researchers wanna know what would be the result on the express genome from, for future generations of rats. What they found is they studied the pups as they grew up compared to pups who had mothers who did not lick them very much, they found that these rats were much freer of eating um, problems. They were less aggressive. They had shinier, thicker coats of hair and it went on. Not only that, the offspring of those pups displayed the same kinds of results. Now, um, we can speculate from there, but there is even more research that we can look at. So we, now we know that diet, drugs, toxins, stress, trauma, all affect uh, epigenetic molecules and how they regulate the expression of them. I would say that college affects your um, uh, epigenome. <laughs> so what can we learn from mother rats then? What's your first thought when you see this picture? When today in America and many other industrialized countries, when a baby is premature, one of the things they recommend right away is to do kangaroo parenting, skin to skin contact. They find that premature uh, low birth weight babies begin to thrive with this kind of human contact. They grow faster, they develop faster, they have less physical health problems. Well, we know that to be true so that this process is becoming more standard 
recommended for all parents at the birth. We also know that it affects, I'm sure it affects fathers. It affects the bonding attachment process, of course, but they find that women have far less um, um, postpartum depression if they do this skin to skin contact. Again, you may be asking uh, yourself, okay, Michael, what does this have to do with uh, slavery? I promise I'll get there. More studies, <laughs> more recent. This is very recent studies from the University of British Columbia. What they did is they followed 100 infants over the first four years. And they asked the parents to keep a journal of feeding and crying and sleeping, but especially physical contact. How much physical care uh, did you actually give to the child? That's not only holding and cuddling skin to skin, but carrying them around, tickling them, all of those kinds of things. At four and a half then, they studied the DNA samples from all of these kids. And of course, what they would do is they were able to compare the children from the high contact parents with the children from the low contact uh, parents. What did they find? They found that the DNA, the epigenome had actually changed. There were big differences in the low physical contact uh, between, um, compared to the high physical contact children. So these things in our life, whether they be trauma, how much we are touched, um, talk to the experiences we have in our life, especially in the early years of development, have a strong effect on our epigenome, our, our DNA, in other words. And then we pass that along. Now, these children actually, they found, is that the low contact children did not develop at a rate that they should. Their maturation level was actually slowed down. So the, uh, from the authors of this study, which was in the pediatric uh, journal, these findings, the first to show that touch has deeply rooted and potentially lifelong and multi-generational consequences on the epigenome, the biochemical changes that affect gene expression. What has happened then, we can speculate, to the epigenome from generation after generation of um, African Americans from slavery on. And when they're still be confronted with trauma today, there continues to be a continued effect on their epigenome. Now, one of the things, how does this affect um, education? This is often referred to, and I think you'll get the reference um, by the end of these two or three slides, the preschool to prison pipeline. Black students are three times more likely than white children to be suspended and expelled from school. And I just found this heartbreaking that even though um, uh, black children only make up 18% of preschoolers nationwide, they account for half of out of school suspensions. Really, preschools preschoolers are suspended from school. Why might that be? Black children are not only less likely to be identified as gifted and talented, but more likely to be recommended for special education. Since 2001, the percentage of K-12 public schools that are in poverty are comprised of mostly African-American or Hispanic students. And this is growing. This is growing since the desegregation of schools in 1954. It's more than doubled from the 7,000 schools you'll see there to more than 15,000. Now, what we find, what do poor schools mean? It means there's less money to spend on each individual student. Uh, teachers are paid less. There are limited or no extracurricular activities. Um, buildings are in decay. What does that tell the black student and the Hispanic student that is going there? There is far more stress on those students. You know, those of you that are college students, how well can you learn when you are feeling stressed 
anxiety. It is almost impossible. Lower grades, less academic motivation, less persistence when encountering an academic challenge. Doesn't that all make sense when you think of the kind of support that those kids need? We have the resources to make every public school um, an enriched environment, a place that children would love to go to and stay, but in our poorest of schools that is not the case. The anxiety surrounding the stereotype of academic inferiority undermines students performing tasks. And now the biological studies, and that is when we take black students in school and compare them to white students, we find that the cortisol, that's the stress hormone, the cortisol levels are far higher in um, students of color than they are with students. And it has to be linked then, according to uh, Emma Adam, has to be due to the impact of systemic racism. Now, before I talk about this, I wanna talk a bit about LeGroy's research. She did some research where she uh, observed this um, and made some changes in some schools that she was working with. She found that once a punitive measures were diminished, discipline, um, when extrinsic rewards like happy faces and candy and other things like that were taken away and replaced with love, with affection and respect from teachers to the black students, all of those things changed. The black students were more often um, uh, entered gifted uh, programs. They were dispelled from school less often. There were less behavioral problems, more academic motivation. And she said the other thing that makes the biggest difference is when those children have a black teacher. Black boys and um, black girls, oh, excuse my spelling there, <laughs> um, are considered older looking and less innocent than white children. So if black boys are considered older, then they're perceived as more dangerous and aggressive. Black girls, on the other hand, are often sexualized at a far earlier age because they are considered looking older. Black boys get killed because they play with guns, toy guns. And you can remember the incidents of Tamir Rice. And black students, especially black boys, are likely to be hyper-disciplined. Uh, one study, and that's not too long ago, 2016, uh, suggests that this hyper-discipline um, is one of the strong reasons that may be related to the higher suicide rates um, among black children. Now, did you know this, that 19 states still use corporal punishment? That's physical punishment paddling, hitting with a hand, uh, slapping belts, you've got it. Okay, and I know when I was a child in Washington state, I got a lot of hacks, but that has been um, overturned. And the first thing I saw when I looked at this chart is Idaho, because I have grandchildren in Idaho, and I had to find out if their daycare or not use corporal punishment, and they didn't. But look, look at the states that this, is most common, the Southern states here. And Mississippi has the highest rate of corporal punishment. A black boy is eight times more likely to get physically punished than a white girl. Black boys are far more often to be expelled than a white boy or a white girl. Now, I mention this because um, much of the research also um, reveals that black parents are much more likely to use corporal punishment on their children than white parents. And 
uh, original research, sociological research I read back probably in the 90s was that this didn't seem to have adverse effects. We know though, we now know about the effects of spanking at a biological level. We now know that spanking children actually changes the structure of the brain. It interferes with a child's ability to make conscious, correct choices. So a spanking might actually be to get a child to correct their behavior, but the effect on the brain actually diminishes the child's ability to make correct choices. I have lots of research if anybody would like to read that. Well, I don't think any child should ever be spanked, especially in school. I love that picture. By the way, they're identical twins. And again, that's another lecture. What are the transgenerational effects of slavery on identity? I'm, Courtney, I am gonna hurry through this a little bit at the end here, okay. Well, um, and you'll be able to come back to this recording as well too. This is the look at these lingering effects of slavery and everyday racism actually for children can uh, have them develop a sense of internalized inferiority. And Margaret Beale Spencer, a black sociologist who has researched this for over 30 years says, the condition where victims of oppression believe subscribe to and internalize the misinformation which is based on the proposition of the inferiority of their own group, often manifesting itself in unconscious feelings and behaviors which means the children don't know that they feel inferiority. All black people, irrespective of their color, shade, darkness, or lightness, are aware from a very early age that their blackness makes them different from mainstream white America. It's important to consider what messages children are receiving about the relative worth of light or dark skin. Remember, these are all remnants of slavery and Janet Belsky writes, racial stereotypes cause children, black children, to distrust teachers' feedback, develop learned helplessness and decide they're dumb and develop, develop um, their academic selves, devalue their academic selves. Um, what's the, what research supports this? And I hate to do this to you, but it's very important. Psychologists Mamie and Kenneth Clark actually originated the white doll, black doll studies uh, that were essential in the Supreme Court actually deciding for the desegregation of schools. And this was in 1954. And the, a story I like to tell is one of Kerry Davis, who in 2005 as a high school senior was exposed to this research and said, it can't be true as a black girl. I don't believe this. And she did her own experiment. So I'm going to show you a short video clip. It's three minutes of her um, research. And she's a, a video documentary filmmaker now, uh, along with a recent study on CNN called the Kids on Race Study. Possibly. It will take just a second to come up here. And it will. And it is does have closed captions.
this is my child and why she was my child. Okay, show me the dumb child. And why is she the dumb child? Well, show me the ugly child. And why is she the ugly child? Because she's the lady. Show me the good looking child. And why is she the good looking child? Because she likes me. This five year old girl gave some provocative answers during her test. I asked her about them later. Why, why do you want that? Because he's playing They ask what color adults don't like. That's right. That's what you said. Why do you think adults don't like that? Dark. Dark. Adults. You think adults don't like dark? Some adults do, Show me the smart child. Okay, why is she the smart child? Because she was thinking. Okay, show me the mean child. Okay, why is she the mean child? Because she's way talking. Okay, show me the good child. Why is she the good child? Because I think she will fight me. Okay, show me the bad child. Why is she the bad child? Because she's a lot darker. Show me the ugly child. Why is she the ugly child? Because she's like a, a lot darker. Okay. Um, well, that is indeed heartbreaking. I'm going to skip a couple of sections here, Courtney, because I know we're out of town. But let's let's end on something really positive here, and maybe a time for a couple of questions. Is it going to be a good day? Yeah. A really good day? Going to be positive? I am strong. I am strong. I am smart. I am smart. I work hard. I work hard. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am respectful. I am respectful. Yes. Say, I'm not better than anyone. I'm not better than anyone. Nobody's better than me. Oh, I am amazing. I am amazing. I am great. I am great. What's your name? Amelia Austin. If you fall, I get back up. What are you? A mess. Yeah. And thank you, God. Thank you, God. For making me. For making me. The greatest. The greatest. There's nobody, There's nobody better, better than me. Than me. Oh, no, we'll watch it again. How's that? I'm done, Courtney. We can. Okay. All okay. right, so we have got, um, I think we've got like the, the big question here in the questions, which is how do we heal from this? Um, which was, th that's the end of <laughs> that I didn't get to. Um, <clears throat> I think the most important thing is, is Beverly Daniel Tatum 
says, we must have, we must stop being passive racists. And that when somebody tells a racist joke or we see racial harassment, we must say something, we must step up. She says, if we don't take an active approach to this, this means everyone, but especially white folks, we are passive racists then, we let it go by. We must become active anti-racists, and that is to speak up. My uncomfort with talking about these issues and teaching them in the classroom is my attempt to become an active anti-racist. That's, that's the big answer to the big question, but there's a, a lot of other answers and things that we can do as well. Yeah, the thing, you know, of course I'm putting on my history hat here, but the thing that this reminded me of when we talk about trauma and reliving the trauma of slavery is the debate over Confederate monuments and how seldom we center the experience of African-American people in those communities, seeing those monuments and what that does to them. And so often it's, yeah, but this is my heritage. It's like, okay, but what does that heritage say and what does it do to everybody else in the community? Um, and that's kind of the thing that, that I kept coming back to when you were talking about this is how do we continue to reinforce the traumas as opposed to alleviate them? And I know in, the, in our area and at LCC, uh, we do not have a lot of students of color. And in this area, in the Longview College County area, not a large population of people of color as well. In college, then we may have the opportunity to actually have these difficult discussions. Don't be afraid to ask um, another student in your class, how, how do they feel ab about the monuments and being taken down and people fighting to keep them up? Mm -hmm. Difficult conversations are the best ones. Yes, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, education is all about is our ability to, uh, our opportunity to see the world beyond ourselves. And, you know, as a white person, obviously this is, this is a different experience, but getting to know people who have family experience with this sorts of trauma uh, has really changed my opinion on a lot of things and and made me more aware of of what else is going on in the world that that is not necessarily affecting me directly so i have a homework assignment for everyone who is watching this and will watch the recording and that is play it at the thanksgiving dinner because you're all going to have zoom thanksgivings right and you can say i'm going to play this and then we can have a discussion about it of course, I'm kidding, but not. Um, <laughs> um, my students tell me often when an issue comes up in a lecture, such as one recently was on spanking, corporal punishment, and its effect on our development, they brought in their wives and husbands and partners and, and grandparents to watch it with them and talk. Okay, well, we really appreciate you sharing this research with us and uh, um, go forth and, and uh, spread the knowledge. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks for everyone who attended. And Courtney, I think we're doing a whole community conversation on race, right? In yes. the spring? Yes, yeah, spring series is going to be on race and we are uh, uh, hoping to have a nice multidisciplinary approach to looking at multiple aspects of race in America and even beyond. And I have just a little bit more that possibly we could tack on to the end of this recording. Um, not more than about 10 minutes or so, but it might be useful to answer that question. What can we do? Okay, great. All right, well, thank I you hope very was, much. I hope it was as fun for all of you as it was for me. Um, I'm now going to go take um, some acid reflux medication. And <laughs> it was disturbing for me, even knowing all of this, but thanks and goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for attending to our uh, attendees and uh, please join us again in the winter. Uh, we'll start back up again on January 14th. Thank you, Michael. Oh, you're so welcome, Courtney. <laughs> yeah. All right. Many, did um, we get...